This is the first of two short videos looking at nonlinear finite element analysis. We'll start out by considering what types of nonlinear problems are typically encountered in FEA. Problems that are nonlinear are problems where the stiffness matrix or the force vector is going to change in response to the applied loads, or more specifically, in response to the displacements that result from the applied loads. The first type that most people are familiar with is material nonlinearity. Whenever you have um, a stress strain curve that is nonlinear, you need material nonlinearity. Geometric nonlinearity is another type. This is where the uh, linear assumptions that we make about small displacements and rotations starts to break down. It also covers things like buckling. And then finally, load or boundary condition nonlinearity. This is going to directly affect the force vector. And this is where we have area changes that affect a distributed load, load followers, or contact situations. So here's an example of material nonlinearity. We have a stress strain curve that changes as the strain increases. So we have a stiffness that responds to the displacement. That's nonlinear. Uh, we don't have to have a traditional curve like this. There are plenty of materials which have a nonlinear elastic region, depending on how they're, they're made up. So that also is included in material nonlinearity. Geometric nonlinearity is a little bit harder for most people to grasp. Here's a quick example. If you have three truss elements connected to a, a single point in the configuration shown here where the two, uh, there are two horizontal truss elements, when I initially apply a load, those two horizontal ones will contribute nothing to the resistance of the displacement. And if I continue increasing the load in a linear model, they still will contribute nothing. However, in a physical part, as soon as the, um, the force causes the vertical one to extend, we start to engage the angled ones because they start to pick up some tension. That's a nonlinear phenomenon rather than the linear analysis that ignores that. Lastly, a couple quick examples for uh, boundary conditions or contact. If you have a force situation like it's shown here, if you get sufficient deflection such that contact occurs, that's going to change the force vector and therefore will change the eventual displacements that we see. Two more nonlinear force examples. If we have a distributed force on a beam, what happens when that beam deflects? Is the load always perpendicular to the beam or does the load, is the load always vertical? This, uh, if the load remains perpendicular to the beam, then we call that a load follower. There are some types of loads that would follow and other types that do not. If the load follows the deformation, that's a nonlinear load. Another type of nonlinear load has to do with contact. Imagine that you have a, a softer material being squished between two plates. As the plates, um, or as, as the plates get closer together, the softer material is going to spread out and we have a greater contact patch that's going to change the force factor as well. The key thing that distinguishes nonlinear from linear analysis is that we can no longer solve the FE problem by just saying the degree of freedom vector is equal to the inverse of the stiffness matrix multiplied by the force vector. This is because either the stiffness matrix or the force vector is going to depend on the degree of freedom vector results. So what we do is we iterate. We try um, making an assumption, we see what happens with that assumption, then we make some modifications and go back and do it again. Um, as with any iteration, we can't guarantee that the iteration is going to converge. And I'll show you an example in the second video where we have a non-convergence of uh, iteration for nonlinear analysis. The stability gets improved if you take smaller steps. So kind of similar to the dynamic analysis, you have a better result if you take it in smaller chunks. Convergence is always monitored during this process by comparing F to KD. We call KD the structure response force and F is the applied force. If those are equal, then we're done. If they're close to being equal, then we're approaching convergence. The two types of iteration techniques that are commonly used in FEA are Newton-Raphson and modified Newton-Raphson. We'll talk about those in more detail in just a moment. Before I talk about those methods, let's talk about stiffness. In a linear problem, there is one stiffness. It's the slope of the force deflection curve. 
However, in a nonlinear problem, that curve has multiple slopes. And at any given point, it actually has two types of slopes that we need to talk about. Imagine that we have a displacement u1 corresponds to a force p. Now, we can talk about secant stiffness, which is just the line connecting the origin to um, the, the point where p and u intersect on our load curve. In other words, k is equal to delta p over delta u. The other type of stiffness that we can talk about is the tangent stiffness. This is the one most people are more familiar with, where it's the derivative of the force with respect to the displacement. Now, if the force is equal to stiffness times displacement, C stiffness being secant stiffness, then the tangent stiffness is equal to the secant stiffness plus the derivative of the secant stiffness with respect to displacement times displacement. So there's a calculation involved here. In FEA, of course, this is a calculation that we're going to be approximating numerically, but using matrices as well. In a linear problem, the secant stiffness and the tangent stiffness are the same thing. That's why we haven't bothered discussing them until this point. Okay, so now let's talk about that newton raphson method for iterating. We're going to look initially at one degree of freedom. In the next video, I'll show you what it looks like for multiple degrees of freedom as an FEA. First thing you want to do is break your load into pieces. The smaller the pieces, the more likely you'll get convergence. We're going to call each one of those pieces a load increment. So we're going to start with load increment P sub J. So J is going to start at one and go up to as many increments as we need to break the total load into a small enough piece to get convergence. Starting this load increment, we want to figure out where we are. So let's imagine this is load increment 12 that we're actually in now. We're going to evaluate everything at the end of load increment 11, and that sets our incoming parameters within load increment 12. Um, inside each load increment, we have an iteration. The iteration index is i. So i equals 1 as soon as we start the load increment, and then it increases as we keep increasing the increment. We have u evaluated at the beginning of the increment. So we're going to have it some initial value, which is equal to what it was at the end of the prior load increment. We have a reaction force, r0, which is what the prior load increment was. And we have our tangent stiffness at the prior load increment as well. Sorry, secant stiffness. Now we can find also the tangent stiffness at this initial displacement. So we're evaluating the stiffness curve effectively. So the tangent stiffness for increment for um, iteration 0, kt0, is equal to the secant stiffness at 0 plus the derivative of the secant stiffness with respect to displacement times the displacement at um, iteration 0. That moves us into now the first actual iteration. So the first new predicted displacement, u1, is equal to u0 plus uh, the force in the, that we're adding in this increment, so pj, minus where we were already. Um, if we're starting at 0, that term would be 0. We're dividing that by the tangent stiffness corresponding to um, iteration 0. Once we have the displacement for our first iteration, we can go and calculate our secant stiffness for the first iteration, so k sub i. That's just evaluating the stiffness at the new displacement. Next, we find our load error, or the residual. So we have the force predicted by the structure, so that's r is equal to k times u. And then we have our error, which is the load increment value minus the force that we're getting out of the structure. Once the force that we're applying is equal to the force that we're getting out of the structure, then we're converged. So we want our error to be equal to zero. That's what this check is. How is that error magnitude? Is it small enough? Now, we obviously can't get to zero, so we identify a max error we're willing to accept. If it is not small enough, then we're going to iterate inside this load increment. And that'll take us back up to the tangent stiffness. We recalculate that and we go back through the process. Now, 
if we were going to do the modified Newton-Raphson, here's where the change comes in. Modified Newton-Raphson skips the recalculation of the tangent stiffness. We go right in with the existing tangent stiffness. That saves us a lot of time. And then we continue to loop around. Now suppose back down at the bottom here, we find that yes, in fact, the error is small enough. Well, then we go on up to the next load increment. That's the basic process. In the next video, I'll walk through uh, several examples following this process. I think it will be more clear then.